So a couple months ago, Dylan Baker and I were in the shop, and we were talking a little bit about tools and talking about how it would be really fun to experiment with some wood stabilization, in particular for some mallet heads. And this is something that's always interested me. A lot of knife makers that I see, a lot of pen turners, a lot of turners in general use stabilized wood. And it's a process I've looked at, but I've never really experimented with. So for a recent issue of Woodsmith Magazine, I went ahead and got a hold of Turn Text down in Texas, and I got some stabilizing supplies, and I wrote an article about it. I want to show you that today. So what is wood stabilizing? Well, honestly, if you've ever played with punky wood at all, so wood that's been sitting and it has fungus starting to grow, you know that A, it can have really cool color and really cool figure, but B, it gets really soft. So by stabilizing it, you're actually replacing some of that soft wood with a hard resin. And it makes it workable, and honestly, it lends some really good properties to it. So when you work with it, it works really nicely. So what do you need for a wood stabilizing process? Well, there's a couple things you need that you probably don't have in your shop. So the first thing you need is a vacuum pump. There's different specs on vacuum pumps, but if you look at the Turntex website, they offer some really good suggestions of pumps that work well for their chambers. Speaking of chambers, I have one of their chambers here. And this happens to be, I believe, the 6-inch model, and it's 12 inches long, but he makes them in all different sizes. This one it seems to be like good size for what I would use it for, which would be pen blanks, some game call blanks, uh, maybe a few small parts or flat projects. And then obviously you need a resin. And the resin I'm using is the resin from uh, Turntex, and that is cactus juice. And it's one of the most popular on the market. It comes as two parts. So with this big gallon jug, it came with a small bottle of activator. Now it's important to note, once you mix the activator in with that gallon, that gallon's pretty much good for a year, give or take. It doesn't harden, um, and you can reuse it and store it in these plastic containers with a little lid on them, uh, and it will last for a long time. But a year lifespan once you mix in the activator is what they suggest. So what else do you need after you have those? Well, obviously you need some blanks. So like I said, I have a, uh, a piece here of Spalton maple. And this stuff's pretty light, it's pretty airy. Uh, it feels kind of styrofoamy. It's pretty soft. Um, so this is a good candidate. And I'm actually going to do this with some colored resins to see if we can get a two-tone effect on this one. And then I just have some other blanks here. And these are just some alder offcuts from uh, one of the projects we filmed on this season of the Woodsmith Shop. Uh, and they, they're kind of cool. They turn well, but they're really light. So by stabilizing them, we add a little weight to them. And that's one of the benefits that stabilizing does. Not only does it harden wood that's punky and soft, it also adds weight to the wood, to the blanks, and it adds a little bit of moisture resistance. Now it's important to note that it doesn't actually make it waterproof. So items that are prone, prone to moisture, like game calls, knife handles, it doesn't make them waterproof, but it does make them moisture resistant. So the wood doesn't expand and contract like it does with uh, changes in humidity like a standard piece of wood would. So, it's a, uh, it's a good thing to use for stuff that's going to be exposed to moisture. So, how do we do this? Well, I'm going to tackle this spalted blank first. Now, I have two different dies here. This is just the standard cactus juice resin that I've used once. Um, and I'm going to do a two-tone die on this spalted piece of maple. So, the first thing I'm going to do, let's do blue first. So, most of the time, the wood needs to be put into the vacuum chamber with the resin to force it in. But the capillary action of the wood will actually draw some of the resin in without vacuum. So I'm just going to float this guy in here and let the capillary action suck some of that blue resin into the wood blank. Get some of that blue off my fingers. And I'm just going to let that sit. And I'm going to let that sit for a probably 12 hours or so. Um, I might come back tomorrow morning and pull that out, and then we'll harden that, and then I will put it in vacuum chamber with a different color, which maybe we'll do green, maybe yellow. So we'll tackle that a little bit later. So let's look at our blanks that are going to be uh, infused with the regular cactus juice, which is going to be clear. So it's not going to add any color, but like I said, we're going to get some of those benefits of it being a little bit more moisture resistant. It's going to be a little bit harder. It's going to turn nicer, in my opinion. And it will be uh, nice to finish. So I like to stack the blanks in here. Um, 
really the lower you can keep the blanks in the chamber, the better, because you're not putting as much resin in there, even though you can dump it out and reuse it. Uh, I like to keep them as low as I can. Then you need an anti-float plate, because once we apply vacuum, these are gonna wanna rise to the top of the resin. And you don't want them to poke out of the top. Uh, you want all the uh, resin to be covering them. So this guy just slides in there and snaps down. Now it's important to note that your blanks do need to be as close to zero moisture content as you can get them. So Turntex suggests baking them in the oven for 24 hours on 220 degrees. And really the whole point there is just to get the temperature of the blanks above the boiling point of water so any moisture that's left in those blanks will turn to steam and evaporate out. Then you can throw them in a plastic bag, let them cool off, and then they're gonna be ready to go in the resin. But now that I have those guys in there, we can go ahead and add our resin. And I'll use the stuff that I've already used. We'll just go ahead and dump that in there. We'll see how close that gets us. And I've been going about, let's call it an inch to two inches above the blanks. And that is just barely covering them. So we're gonna add a little bit more. And more resin is not going to hurt anything. Like I said, we can reuse it. So I'm not worried about wasting it. Okay. Then we can pop on our top and with these turn text chambers, that just sits on there. There's a gasket that goes around the edge um, with a lip uh, and uh, Curtis down at turn text CNC's all these. So they're really nice fit. Um, I did notice that these tops can warp a little bit. So if you plug in your vacuum, turn it on and you don't get any vacuum on your gauge, uh, I noticed just pressing down quick will form a seal and then it will start to pull vacuum. And then the vacuum pump just goes right on there, okay? So this is basically ready to turn on. Now, when I turn this pump on, I'm gonna leave this valve open. So it's not actually gonna be drawing any vacuum yet. But as I start to close that valve, the vacuum's gonna start drawing on the resin. It's gonna create a low pressure area above the resin. And any air that is in this lower section is gonna be under higher pressure. And that air is gonna want to migrate from the high pressure in the resin and in the wood to the low pressure above. It's not actually sucking air out of anything. It's just creating two different pressure differentials and that's what causes this whole thing to work. But as the air starts to escape out of the wood into the low pressure area, it's gonna cause a lot of foaming. So I'm gonna sit here for a few minutes and I'm gonna feather this valve open and closed just to make sure that that foam doesn't get up and suck back into my vacuum pump. If it does, not that big a deal. Just dump out the oil out of the vacuum pump, clean it out, replace the oil, and it should be good. Uh, but if we can avoid it, I'm going to. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn my pump on. And I'm gonna start closing the valve. And as that foam starts to rise, I'm gonna open up the valve to knock it back down. Close it again. And with some of these oil-filled pumps, you're gonna notice a, uh, it looks like a smoke coming out of them. It's not actually smoke. Uh, they can create an oil mist as they're building up pressure, uh, but that will go away after a few minutes of running. So I think we're starting to get up to pressure. You can see the bubbles are coming out of the end of the blanks. Um, the end grain kind of tends to be, uh, from my experimenting, seems to be the most uh, direct route for the air to come out of the fibers. So you notice the end grain's going to be bubbling a lot. Um, but it looks like it's pretty much settled down. I'll keep an eye on it for a few more minutes, but then I'm gonna let this sit under pressure. And it can sit under pressure, depending on the blanks, anywhere from six to 15 hours, but longer isn't gonna hurt it. Uh, this pump is gonna get warm, so I wanna make sure it's not close to any resin because that resin is a heat cure. So if the resin would start to warm up because of the pump heat, it can start to cause it to cure. Uh, these are made to run hot, so don't worry about that at all. 
Um, but like I said, I'm gonna let this run probably for 15 hours or so until basically all the bubbles that are coming out of the blanks are gone. Uh, we wanna make sure that there's no air coming out of them. Uh, and that way when we shut the pump off, we're gonna let that resin reabsorb back into the wood. Uh, the, the pressure differentials are gonna switch. So when the pump is shut off, this then becomes the high pressure area. This becomes the low pressure and that resin is then forced into the wood. Uh, so once I shut the pump off, I'm gonna let them soak. The rule of thumb is to let them soak in the resin double the amount of time they're under vacuum. So if I let this vacuum run all night, let's call it 15 hours, I'm gonna let these soak for 30 hours before I pull them out. So this is not gonna be a terribly fast process, but it's well worth it in the end. So I'm gonna let this run and I'll see you guys back here tomorrow morning. So our blanks have been soaking now, honestly, for about a week. It doesn't matter really how long these things soak. And that's an important thing to note about this process. Any of the stabilizing stuff really doesn't matter if it goes for extra time. So just because these have been stabilizing for a week because we've been busy filming our TV show, they're honestly going to be all better for them. But now we can get back to them and get them cured. So let's just go ahead and pull the lid off. And I have a roll of paper towels here just to contain some of the mess. And this cactus juice is non-toxic, so it's not going to hurt me at all uh, when I reach into it. But I'm going to store this in one of these plastic pink containers. So let's pour off the extra. Some extra will drain out of there for a minute. And then we can remove that weight plate. Actually, let's stick a lid on here. Now, that's one of the important things to note about this cactus juice is it will cure if you store it in a glass container with a sealed lid. So really, your best bet is one of these plastic paint containers with a lid that's not terribly tight. That way it will last for up to a year. All right. Now these blanks come out, and they're pretty wet. They're dripping with resin. That's all right, though. And this cactus juice requires heat to stabilize them, or heat to cure the resin, rather. So, the stabilizing temperature, or the curing temperature for this resin, is between 185 and 200 degrees. And it has to get to that temperature internally for 10 minutes for the resin to cure. So make sure you have a good oven thermometer, and I'm going to use a toaster oven to cure these. And you don't really want to ever put any chemicals in an oven that you use for food preparation. Even though this is non-toxic and it's probably safe, you don't want to put it in your oven that you prepare food in. So I'm just going to get these blanks stacked on the wire here. And the guys over at Turntex suggest wrapping these blanks in foil. And that does contain a lot of the mess. Some of the resin will seep back out as it starts to heat up, but the microwave or the toaster oven that I have here has a pan and a rack in it. And the pan underneath will catch any resin that does drip out and it doesn't really stick to the rack so I'm not terribly concerned about it but you can wrap them with aluminum foil to contain some of it. Okay and without wrapping them you want to make sure that they're not touching otherwise they will fuse and cure into a big block. So now that I have them in there, I'm going to turn the oven on. And I've been using this toaster oven for a while now, and I know that where I have the temperature set, it's going to hit that target of 200 degrees and hold it there. So I'm going to let those cure at least for an hour and a half, but honestly, I've been going for about four hours. Once you pull a blank out, if it's not cured, you cannot stick it back in the toaster oven to re-cure. So you want to make sure you get it right the first time. So I've been going to the four hour mark with most of my blanks. So let's set this guy off to the side for now. And you don't want to put the resin next to the toaster oven because the heat will cause this to cure. So let's just keep that away here. And let's take a look at one of these blanks that I've already done. So this is the blank that I put in the dyed resin. This was that spalted maple blank. If you recall, I put it in the blue resin. And what it was doing is the capillary action was soaking that blue into the softer fibers of the wood. I pulled that out after a day or two, and I stuck it into the oven to cure the blue resin that had been soaked in. Once that was done, I went ahead and stuck it in another vacuum chamber with the green resin, and I allowed that resin to be drawn deeper in the wood. Once that was done, I cured it once again, and that leaves me with these blanks. 
These blanks, once I turn them, will have a lot of different color in them. They'll have the blue, it'll have the green, and then it'll actually have some blending of the two colors. So it's a really cool process to get a two-tone effect. Let's talk about dyeing the resin. The dye that I used is the stuff that Turntech sells. It is their cactus juice stabilizing dye. It is a concentrated dye, but you have to add quite a bit of it into the resin to get a good color. You can use uh, other dyes, such as trans tint. However, you don't want to add too much because it can affect how the resin will absorb into the wood. So, my blanks are going to cook in the oven for about four hours, but I'm not going to make you guys wait that long. I have a piece of alder that I've already stabilized, and I did this a couple of weeks ago for the article that I was writing, and it doesn't look much different than what you would expect an alder blank to look like. The resin's been absorbed in here. It's about three times heavier than standard alder would be, so when you pick it up, you know something is a little different with it. But it doesn't impart any color, really, but it's gonna work a little bit differently. And honestly, when I've been turning the stuff that I've stabilized, it turns really easily. I'm not the world's best turner, but really the stabilized wood doesn't seem to tear out or crush like normal wood does, and it turns really nice, plus it polishes really well, and it takes a finish beautifully. And I haven't found any finish that stabilized wood won't absorb. So oils are great, uh, lacquer finishes, anything like that. But I've been really just sanding up to about a thousand grit and then buffing it with beeswax. And it's a really, really nice finish. So is adding a stabilizing setup for everybody? Maybe not. It is kind of a specialized process. But if you're dabbling in knife making or if you're a turner and you really want to use a special piece of wood that is starting to spalt a little bit or has some extra color, it's honestly really worth being able to use it. The stabilizing setup isn't terribly expensive, and it opens up a wide variety of possibilities for using spalted wood, for adding color to your projects, or even making something more workable. And it's definitely worth checking out.